Hello, my name is Leslie Anderson. I'm the chief curator here at the National Nordic Museum. Welcome to What is Nordic Design Sweden? I wanna thank, first off, the Nordic Culture Fund for making this program series happen, as well as Arts Fund. The main um, objectives of this series, which is five parts, and we're now on the fourth, the fourth of, of five, um, is to provide an introduction to Nordic design, to examine the idea of na a national school of design versus a pan-Nordic school of design, and also to connect design historians, curators of design, directors of design museums, thought leaders in this, um, in this area uh, from the Nordic countries and the US. AFICA will follow, which is an opportunity for you to ask questions of the speakers um, that may not have been covered in the conversation portion. And I just want to mention, mark your calendars for the last program in the series, which is devoted to Norway, and that will take place on December 9th. And then next week, next Saturday, we have Dr. Maggie Taft, author of The Chieftain and the Chair, The Rise of Danish Design in Post-War America, here, same place, same time. Um, on Sunday, and she'll be in conversation with Kimo Greggs from the University of Washington. All of the programs in the What is Nordic Design series are being recorded, and they'll be posted online at a later date. Um, if you want to share with a friend, or if you perhaps missed one of the previous programs devoted to Finland, to Iceland, or to Denmark. Now it's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Nina Dua, who is the director of the Roska Museum of Design and Craft in Gothenburg, Sweden. She has more than 20 years experience of working for museums and cultural institutions, including the Victoria and Albert Museum, the British Council, and the Design Museum in London as a curator and head of exhibitions before taking over the directorship at the Roska in 2017. Uh, prior to her time at, at her current institution, her curatorial work has included thematic exhibitions of designs of the year and unexpected pleasures, the art and design of contemporary jewelry, and United Micro Kingdoms, a design fiction. She has delivered monographic shows on the architect Richard Rogers and textile art artist Ani Albers. Throughout, she has worked extensively to create collaborations and prototype new methods between museums, cultural institutions, and their audiences. Notable public programming includes Friday Lates at the V&A and initiating international residency programs, both at the Design Museum London and now at her current institution in Gothenburg. She's led extensive renovation and reopening of the museum um, that she's currently at in 2019, and she's overseen the rehang and delivery of five permanent exhibitions from East Asian galleries to the Contemporary Design and Craft Collections, Considering design as a lens through which to understand and re-engage the world that we live in, under her stewardship, the Roska Museum has organized temporary exhibitions across design, architecture, crafts, and fashion to include unmaking democratic design, forensic architecture, migration, the journey of objects, and Nordic fashion now, knitwear and print. After her talk, Nina will be joined by Sarah Holian for a conversation. Sarah Holian is the curator of the Frank Lloyd Wright Trust in Chicago, and she's a lecturer at DePaul University. She specializes in modern architecture and design, and she has earned her, her graduate degrees in art history from the University of Texas at Austin and the Graduate Center of the Center, uh, City University of New York, where we were classmates some time ago. Um, Sarah Holian has lived uh, for two years in Malmo, where she developed a strong interest in Nordic design. So please give a warm welcome for Nina, and, and then later for Sarah Holian, who will be joining Nina. Thank you, thank you. Um, and thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here in Seattle. It's my first time visiting Seattle, and therefore also the first time here at the National, Museum, National Nordic Museum. Um, as Leslie mentioned, I'm maybe not the ultimate person to talk about Sweden because I'm Norwegian, but I think we are still close enough neighbors to have some idea of it. And also, um, having spent most of my career in the UK and only the last six years in Sweden, I think maybe that my presentation today is uh, perhaps, if we could call it less patriotic towards Sweden, but trying more to think that um, whilst we're, the question is here, is there a national school of Swedish uh, design or is there a pan-Scandinavian design school? Um, I think you will quite quickly see that I am 
I'm not trying to pigeonhole Swedish design in a particular way, but I think as we all from different nations are hugely influenced by each other too. So I'm trying to draw some strings, not just from the Nordic region, but also from all, all, part, all uh, parts of the world. Uh, but first, a brief presentation about the museum where I work. Let me get the buttons right here. Um, the Röska Museum of Design and Craft opened in 1916 and is the only museum in Sweden specializing in design and craft. The museum collects historical and contemporary design, arts and craft as a way of focusing and deepening the relevance of the material and design world in a wider societal context. The museum is based in Gothenburg, the second largest city in Sweden, and Röska has a unique collection of over 50,000 objects and artifacts from 4,500 year old Sweet Chinese artifacts to contemporary Swedish design and craft. Using design as a lens through which to explore the world, the Röska Museum offers our visitors several different ways to experience and gain perspectives of design. From traditional permanent collection displays, temporary exhibitions marrying the past, present and future, residents, emerging designers and craft practitioners and a rich program of activities for all ages. So what I was alluding to earlier is what I can say already now is that this presentation is not a kind of the top of class Swedish design classics. Instead, I hope to shine a light on why it's maybe more relevant uh, or less relevant to pigeonhole what is specifically Swedish design and instead draw our attention to why the Swedish design vernacular has developed as it has over the past hundred years or so. Now, I don't know if um, any of you have watched the Nordic crime series, The Bridge, um, but I think it's quite a good segue into this topic and you wonder why. Well, um, the interiors and its entire aesthetic are very design focused when the scenes are from this home of Saga's Danish work partner, Martin. You can see how the Danish design history unfolds in all the uh, domestic scenes. But when on the Swedish side, um, Saga's home is chaotic, no design classics in sight. However, she has an awesome car, which happens to be German a Porsche 911S coupe, which was apparently designed for the American market. So what I'm trying to get to here, given that we had uh, uh, some other presentations, both from Denmark and uh, Iceland previous days, is that I would say that the design culture in Denmark is live and well in terms of its um, uh, focus on mid-century modern. But whereas in Sweden, I would say it is much more spread out and it's very difficult in some ways to pinpoint exactly what defines Swedish design. But of course, that doesn't exclude a certain Swedish design history that we witness in everything from architecture to furniture, glass, ceramics and textiles, even in current day Sweden. Here you have the red colored houses that continue being used in contemporary architecture. On both, on the bottom left design, the design museum in Vandalorum, designed by the Italian architect Renzo Piano. And to your, le to your left, um, the building by Marge Architects in the very center of Stockholm. And this is of course the, the famous Falu Red uh, you probably know of Falu Korv, the sausage, and it's there coming from that color of, of the red that is very significant of Sweden and Swedish vernacular architecture. On the chair side, of course, we also have some design classics, both the Mats Teselius chair, which is maybe not in every home, but it does pride a lot of public buildings. I met somebody here on Friday who had the Ingve Ekström chair, uh, yeah, you're over there, I, I spotted you there. And uh, the Bruno Matson chair, of course, which is also very famous. Now, Sweden is maybe most famous for its glass. And for those of you who've been there, you've been to Glasriket or the Kingdom of Glass, 
which is a fantastic um, area of Sweden with not just these small glass huts, but also where the big companies reside, such as um, uh, Costa Buda and Odafors, of course. Ceramics and porcelain also has a deep tradition in Swedish design. And both Gustavsberg um, and uh, with, with famous people like Steen Lindberg and Wilhelm Koge are one of the key people who have produced seminal work within that uh, technique and material. But I think also what you will see throughout my presentation is that where um, handicrafts, of course, plays a huge role in, in Swedish design, Sweden has also been extremely good at manufacturing and mass production. And even at Gustavsberg, their um, hygiene products have been massively popular. And I particularly like the, the ranges they did in the 60s and 70s, which were kind of wild colors that you so not see today. But they have recently, if anyone goes back to Stockholm in the near future, Gustavsberg was a factory, has now opened as a museum. Um, under the leadership of the National Museum in Stockholm. And it is a magnificent display of their entire history, so I warmly recommend that. Now, um, I do not think, as I said, it's too simple to frame design classics as pure Swedish. Uh, I believe it's a key to look at how transnational factors have played a role in both the establishment of certain design histories in Sweden and the Swedes need and desire to promote themselves globally. I do not think it's relevant to draw you, I do think it's relevant to draw your attention to the location of Gothenburg, given its international relevance in global trade and manufacturing for centuries, which in turn has led to how Swedish design and innovation has branched out in the world, but also how the world has inspired Swedish design. Take, for example, the Swedish East India Company that was founded in Gothenburg in 1731 for the purpose of conducting trade with China and the Far East. The venture was inspired by the success of Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. And this made Gothenburg the set epicenter of European trade for Eastern products for centuries. The legacy of the Swedish India, East India Company is very much present in the collections at the Röska Museum, which I will also come to shortly. Two other key international companies worth mentioning here the for the purpose of design is SKF and Volvo, which I will also come to later. But I'm still taking you on a little historical journey, also because I'm a museum person. I think this is highly relevant. Um, because, of course, other international influences were the great exhibition of the world of industry of all nations, also known as the Great Exhibition of 1851, which was an international exhibition that took place in Hyde Park in London in 1851. It was the first of a series of world fairs, exhibitions of culture and industry that became popular in the 19th century. And the event was organized in this case by Henry Cole and Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria. And this led, this enormous success of that first exhibition led to the establishment of the world famous Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And the name of course came from the Royal Queen and King themselves. It was and still is today a museum that celebrates the best of art and craft from around the world. And then a museum that also has come to inspire a number of similar museums across Europe and beyond. And one such place was the Röska Museum in Gothenburg. Gothenburg was deeply inspired by what they saw was happening in London. And here you see the beginnings of the building that was built in the turn of the 20th century. Now Sweden was relatively late to build a museum dedicated to the applied arts and design. A number of museums, similar museums, had already been built in Europe. Now, like many other museums of art and industry, the Röska Museum was founded with private donations. The two manufacturing brothers, Wilhelm and August Röss, which the name Röska comes from, had created a fortune on timber exports and cotton imports. And in their wills, they donated funds for the construction and furnishing of a museum building as well as funds for purchase, purchasing the museum's future collections. And I'm proud to say that their funds are still gaining 
uh, value today and is helping us to still buy uh, objects for our collection. Now, the first museum director, Axel Nilsson, who was to lead the project, began his speech at the Röska Museum's building committee by stating that a museum of art and industry is, according to modern concepts, an institution which should not, like the toothbrush, be considered enjoyment solely for the upper classes. Now, saying that, this was very much still based on a museum that was meant to educate us in terms of good taste. Today, the Röska Museum's mission is to collect and exhibit design and craft traditions and their disparate expressions and to stimulate awareness and knowledge uh, of historic contemporary design and craft. The driving force in the museum's initial con construction was to educate and promote good taste, as I said. But today, the museum would rather emphasize the impact that design plays by referencing the his history of design and craft and to situate contemporary practices that connect to our everyday lives. Our ambition is to offer a free zone for contemplation and conversation, working towards broadening our audiences to better reflect the diversity of society as a whole. And whilst that might sound uh, obvious, and I know speaking to the colleagues here at the National Nordic Museum as well is something that museums now really strive for is broadening audiences. We, we know we have been elitist for a very long time, um, and it's really about trying to develop programs and exhibitions that opens up for, uh, to be relevant for more and a broader public. Oh dear, okay. I think we'll be fine. I think we'll be fine. Um, back to industry. Now, um, it's worth mentioning the two global names that I mentioned, um, the two Brit Swedish companies. The one was SFK, which stands for um, Svenska Kullagerfabriken, or the Swedish Ball Bearing Factory, and Volvo. Both companies are therefore deeply connected. Um, in 1926, SKF sales manager Assar Gabrielsson sought the permission of his managing director to build 10 passenger automobiles using SKF's parts and resources. Gabrielsson proposed this would be a first step in a plan that would see SKF's established factory to produce, produce 8,000 cars annually, which of course in those days were quite a lot, constructed and assembled in Sweden. Gabrielson showed his confidence in the project by offering to fund the expenses for the first cars himself. Now, the SFK board took notice, and which allowed the company to study the function of bearings in cars and extend its involvement in the growing motor industry. They decided to take financial responsibility for the project, providing access to an unused manufacturing facility and a company owned by SKF by the name Volvo. And if you didn't know, Volvo means, it's Latin for I roll. The company named Volvo had been established by SKF in 1914 to manufacture rigid deep groove ball bearings with filling shots. But from 1927, Volvo came to produce cars and were, being, and were the very beginnings of how we know the global brand today. And here you see the Volvo photograph, the first Volvo photograph in front of the Art Museum in Gothenburg. And to your left, the catalogue uh, called Machine Art. There they even used the ball bearing as their main cover photograph for the exhibition um, at MoMA in 1934. Other key events for Swedish design and innovation were the World, World Fair for Design and Industry held in Stockholm in 1930, where countries, not least the USA, began to take notice of Swedish design and craft. Now, the illustration on your left was a proposal by the Swedish architect Sigurd Leverens of the floating dance floor for the Stockholm exhibition in 1930. It was never realized, but don't forget this image as we move on. Now, the immigration of the Nordic people were immense during the 1800s and early part of the 1900s. This mass movement of people were also being expressed by artists, designers, and craftspeople, 
who themselves were immigrants or commented on the movement through their art. The Swedish sculptor Carl Milles captured this in his bronze piece, Fish with Immigrants from 1940. And just behind the Carl Milles image from the previous slide, the tapestry by Swedish weaver Lillian Holm depicting Cranbrook Academy in art, of Art in Michigan. And as you may well know, Cranbrook Academy of Art was during the first half of the century very much influenced by Nordic designers, architects and craftspeople, much thanks to the Finnish chief architect of the numerous buildings on the campus, Elial Sarinen. But it wasn't, um, it wasn't very often that female designers would get recognition in the creative industries, and is not so unusual even today. Not in Sweden or abroad, but the Swedish furniture and interior designer and architect, Grena, Greta Magnusson Grossman, she gained recognition. She was one of the few female designers to get, gain prominence during the 20th century architectural scene in Los Angeles, after she moved there from Sweden with her husband in 1940. Her early exposure, exposure to European modernism deeply influenced her later architectural work, as seen as a synthesis of European ideals and the culture and lifestyle of Southern California. Now, Josef Frank, he was an Austrian architect of Jewish descent who in 1930 emigrated to Sweden. He was employed by Estrid Eriksson at Svensk 10 in 1934, and already a few years later, the duo Frank Eriksson had their international breakthrough. Svensk 10's exhibitions, exhibition rooms at the World Expo in Paris 1937 and New York in 1939 were characterized contrary to the ideals of the time by bold contrasts, both in terms of materials, colors, and patterns. And they received a lot of attention and became somewhat paradoxically the very model of, um, for the concept of Swedish modern at the time. And it's also fair to say that uh, Josef Frank is still immensely popular in Sweden and um, worldwide today as well. And Svensk 10, which has been going now for so long, are still hugely in demand. Perhaps a lesser known person is Otto Schultz. Otto Schulz founded and ran Boet in Gothenburg, one of Sweden's most successful interior stores. Schulz can be said to be the Gothenburg equivalent of Josef Frank and the shop Boe, much like Svensk 10 in Stockholm. And both had the bourgeoisie customers as their target group. After being educated in Germany and Berlin, Schulz came to Gothenburg during 1910. With a wide register of design ideals, he designed furniture and interiors in all possible styles. Today, Schultz is relatively unknown, but he carried out an incredibly varied designs until about 1950. Schultz has not received much attention from posterity, partly because he designed furniture that, <clears throat> that stood out from the prevailing trends. However, the, the, the Raska Museum found that his, his work was so prolific that we have now acquired 1,700 of his illustrations and also the, the cabinet that you see which are depicting scenes from Gothenburg so it felt very um, right for it to be at the Raska Museum. So with these historic examples of Swedish design that have either been born out of national and traditional value systems and local influences or inspired by more global outlook and influences from abroad, I want to draw your attention to the Röska Museum of Design and Craft, where I work and would like to showcase the very point that Swedish design is perhaps broader than what we deem is typically Swedish. The museum when I joined was closed for a um, refurbishment and reorganization. And when we opened in 2019, we really tried to sharpen the ways in which we continue to develop methods to engage with our public in order to make their visit in connection with the museum and its content more open and meaningful. We have now uh, developed a number of permanent exhi ex um, exhibition displays, like Leslie mentioned earlier. 
And we have amongst them the East Asia collection. And as I mentioned in, in the introduction, the connection with the East India Company really played a pivotal role in us collecting so much Chinese work. Um, in fact, one of the first collections that were ever registered in our database, the, the analog database, I should say, were the objects from China and Japan, as you see here. And I think the very first object was a Netsuke uh, from Japan that was logged in our books. What is therefore important with all these historical collection is that we also value and see the importance collaborating with contemporary artists and designers who can re reassess and reinterpret our historic collections. Here you see the Swedish artist Lapsi Lam studying the Chinese collection, which formed part of a solo exhibition with her work and works inspired by our East Asia collection. Now we move into the 1700 or the 18th century arts and craft displays. It's a collection and highlights the influences of Swedish furniture and decorative arts from the Far East and what it inspired in terms of furniture and porcelain ornamentation, color and techniques and especially with um, manufacturers such as Röstrand and Gustavsberg, these were really pivotal in the way that um, one were inspired by the, the techniques from the Far East. But again, we can't get always stuck in the past. It's also important to work in the present. And we have a very uh, close relationship with the art school next to us, which is um, Högskolan for Konst or uh, Design. Um, which uh, takes in furniture students who there make their own interpretations of this collection. And we make sure that they can also show it to the public after the end of their term. Um, here we are now in the Baroque times. Um, and this is an original interior from the sugar mill factory just outside the city of Gothenburg that was moved to the museum when the museum opened in 1916. These are original oil um, wallpapers, so they need a lot of attention. And extensive conservation work has been done in the past two years with what we call a live open display where the visitors can actually see the work in progress. But it's also, again, here important to activate um, historic centerpieces with contemporary practice. And this time, the Norwegian-based Brazilian Japanese designer, Kiyoshi Yamamoto, who studied our collection, he did it from a post-colonial perspective. He was particularly problematizing and exploring the ways in which the museum had in its early years acquired the collection from China and produced new work to comment this. Well, you can't have a design museum without chairs. And we have a historical timeline of chairs in our open store gallery with the main focus on Swedish and Nordic design. And the circle chair here is again the Bruno Matson chair, which also is featured in the newly renovated town hall in Gothenburg. The town hall is a fantastic building and the interior is even more fantastic, I think. It was designed by the Swedish architect Gunnar Asplund and has gone through a huge renovation project where, of course, a lot of the furniture um, is part of the Swedish canon. Now, this is a, a statement that we apply to our work at the museum. Design is everywhere. And we use it as a device to address the breadth of what design is and can be. And I read you a short uh, text that will hopefully clarify even more. Everything from the mobile in your pocket to your bicycle, the social media feed and the t-shirt you're wearing are all designed by a human, an algorithm or a machine. Design gives shapes to things, making them easier to use and manufacture, more appealing to consumers and designers, and design can add value. However, design is also an act associated with reflection and change. It can be a way to protest injustice, to criticize, or to comment the prevailing social order. It has therefore been our mission at the museum to explore the very idea of design being everywhere and connect it to a larger societal question and debates. 
We have, over the past few years, hosted exhibitions on, for example, climate change, with a particular focus on plastic. And plastic is also an interesting material, given how um, hostile it is to our natural climate. But the paradox is, once you have a plastic collection in a museum, it gets dry, it gets brittle, and the idea of having these objects for eternity becomes very frail when you have a plastic collection in a museum. So we thought also that was an interesting um, thing to, to address in, in this particular show. Uh, we combined the objects from our collection with displayed alongside works by contemporary Swedish and international designers who use in, innovative methods and the reuse of materials to address the vast and complex challenges we are facing climatically. We can't talk about Swedish design without talking about IKEA, eller IKEA. Um, and of course, um, that being the Swedish brand that somehow has democratized the very notion of Swedish living to a global audience. The ideal that everyone can afford and build their own home with the furnishings they want was something we wanted to explore in this exhibition called Unmaking Democratic Design. We worked with the Swedish furniture designer Fredrik Paulsson, where we uh, accompanied his furniture that plays both on humor and the use of off-the-shelf readily materials. So all the, the furnishings you see here are things that he's gone to the DIY shop and he's produced these uh, pieces uh, from that. Um, so they're ready, avail ready available materials and the furniture was also made by the public at the museum during the course of the exhibit. Because we decided to have a workshop within the exhibition. So in the bottom right hand corner you see a wall that looks very empty but as the exhibition moved on you had the visitors who came in very excited, they booked their slot, and in there you were paired up with two strangers, and the four of you were then asked to make a chair together, um, which was both an interesting exercise in itself of trusting each other and taking advice from people you don't know, um, but it became a fantastic display of all sorts of furniture which then um, was later you could come and pick up your chair or we even kept some for our collection. Um, this year we hosted an exhibition also called Nordic Fashion Now, Knitwear and Print. We wanted to celebrate and highlight the diversity and high quality work that is being produced at Nordic design schools right now. Design education in the Nordic region has been in stiff competition with design schools overseas especially England, Holland, Italy, but also the US. But there is a shift, especially in fashion, where innovation and high quality graduate work is becoming more and more visible. One cannot pinpoint one aesthetic, but rather an interest in telling stories that become visible through the craft of making and understanding the materials that they work with. Um, and in 2021, this was during the very special times in Sweden where the rest of the world was still somewhat in lockdown. But as you well know, Sweden didn't continue in the same vein. So we were working frantically with producing exhibitions. And um, even though we were only closed for five months, we still had an audience uh, coming for most of the time. And with this exhibition, we wanted to place the museum's collection in a global historical context. Different ways in which design migrates were examined. We asked what journeys have the objects made before they ended up in the museum's collection? How can one understand why similar motifs and patterns appear in different cultures and different eras? How do local natural resources affect the design and the trade of design? We used our collections to draw historic connections with the craft disciplines, but also to address the ways in which Nordic design and craft has narrated its own histories for centuries. Where, for example, the extraction of materials such as iron has deeply influenced the, the influenced manufacture uh, and the Swedish army and at the age of slave trade, which was new to, new to us, but it was one of those things when you start researching for an exhibition, and you delve deeper into it, it became very um, obvious. Uh, 
We also then uh, started to examine how much of um, our collection can, had representation from the Sami community, which again was embarrassingly small. Um, it even became uh, to the point that we had, uh, I think we had about 10 pieces in our collection. And I mentioned earlier, we have 50,000 objects in our collection. Um, we had to borrow um, objects from the Nordic Museum in Stockholm. Uh, but we also saw this as an opportunity to engage with contemporary practitioners. And we commissioned the Sami artist Olof Marsha to do a piece of work for us. And um, I've, I've directly translated it um, to um, the, the title of it is What if the bear was the sun and the sun was the bear? And he did a fantastic piece of work where he worked both with um, traditional craft um, methods, but also intertwined it with a lot of modern methods. He worked with glass, with leather, um, with wood carvings, and uh, the narration was beautiful both in illustrations he made prior to it coming on display, but also um, during um, the exhibition where it was particularly great for the pedagogues to, to tell the stories with younger groups of people. Um, we uh, collected it for our collection and it will also not just be a temporary display but also a permanent display for the future. But it made me also then uh, get even more curious about what was on here at the National um, Nordic Museum. And I checked out the website before I came here and saw that the Arctic Highways was on. Now, Sweden's troubled and dark history of the struggle and oppression of the Sami people is only in recent years coming to the surface in more mainstream culture in Sweden and further afield. This year, we saw for the first time an all Sami-led Nordic pavilion at the Venice Biennale in Italy. And artists such as Britta Marakat Labbe from Sweden, which is the um, artist's work in the bottom uh, right-hand corner, um, and the Norwegian Gunvor Guttorm's work for a light up in the um, right-hand corner. I don't think that particular work is there, but they are featured here in this exhibition, and they are really at the forefront and making Sami art and craft seen and heard globally. Now, one can't talk about Swedish design without also talking about the welfare state and in its inherent culture. Um, although I must say it's becoming more and more a contentious topic given the political and economic climate, even in Sweden. But I do want to end this presentation by lifting some examples that take us uh, out of the home and into the public realm. Gothenburg celebrated its 400th jubilee this year uh, and the city worked for years leading up to this moment by extending certain parts of the city that otherwise were part of the docks and the port industry to become a haven for public recreation. Now if you recall the image from the Stockholm Fair of 1930 and Sigurd Lavrens's illustration of a dance floor floating on the water in Stockholm, this, I would say, is not too far, far from it, and this time it got realized. Now, there wasn't only a pool of three different pools, but also a sauna has been up there for quite a few years now. And it looks quite brutal and maybe for some uninviting from the outside, but once you're in there, it's fantastic. It's actually also so popular that the waiting list is nearly a year long. So, um, Book it now if you're going. <laughs> there is one group of people that we must not forget, the kids. Um, now, the welfare system is, a, is key for the dynamic family life in Sweden and public commissions to create playgrounds and less uniform objects for interaction and play play a key role in creating unique and explorative experiences for the children. And this was a playground that was created um, in the same area of the harbour also during this time. Um, and I would say that the design language is far from mid-century modern, but instead it really promotes forms and functionalities that challenges the user in a positive and playful way and maybe place on 
um, not a traditional design language that we're familiar with in Sweden. And also even this notion that everything has to be so safe and accident proof. Here you have uh, metal and you have concrete blocks. Um, and that was a big challenge, I believe, for the council to even approve of. But again, it's been a very successful um, playground that is being widely used, and especially after this, um, this jubilee. And that brings me to the end, before uh, Sarah also joins me on stage, and we will continue the conversation. Thank you. That was terrific. And I really like how you highlighted that the concept of design isn't solely national or solely Swedish in the way that it often is pigeonholed in these kinds of dialogues. But it really, from its inception, at least the inception of the Rohiska, was founded in a global kind of language. And all of these interactions through world's fairs, uh, the movement of artists and people, and moving from that concept of being insular, if we think of insular within the home and in the private space, to a much more public kind of space and public design. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if you might um, maybe speak a bit more about some of the other kinds of public spaces that are being designed now. Sure. Um, well, I think that there are a lot of um, focus on architecture in Sweden, much more than design. And I don't think that's purely for Sweden. I think it's a common ground because it's somewhat easier to talk about something big that is so obviously in front of you. Um, but more and more now, architects and designers see that they also have a common language. And I think that is when it becomes interesting to think of the spaces in between where design plays a real important role in, in building our built environment. Um, being in the city, uh, or being um, out of the city, of course. So I would say that in Sweden, there is a real focus on trying to marry the, the disciplines more closely to see that you have um, what is called total design, that you really you know, have thought about all the different aspects also outside. I would say that in, you have architects from the past, Alto and um, lots of other great architects who got a commission to build a building. And it wasn't just in the building and the um, interior, the, the fixed furnishings, but they also got to design the furniture, the bins, the ashtrays. They kind of, there was a total, total kind of thinking towards it, which makes those buildings what they are today. And I think often when we are uh, encountering modern buildings, where you have one architect at the outside and a different architect doing the inside and you have you know, different designers who, it is a, often a mismatch of things. And I think that is now coming to the fore of, okay, how do we make it more coherent? And some of that is also in partnership with the public. So again, maybe this idea of the welfare society and also the the democratic kind of outlook on how citizens should be an active part in it. You have a lot of public projects now which invite focus groups in to also be part of the decision making or trying to influence at least um, some of these aspects to maybe make these experiences more coherent. Certainly, and certainly working on Frank Lloyd Wright, his focus on an organic design and need to control all of those aspects from not just the architecture, but the interiors and dress mm, even mm, mm. Um, speak to that yes, as well. Yes, I should have mentioned him, of course. <laughs> <laughs> he, he does have a connection to Sweden, actually, that um, his partner when he left Oak Park, Mae Machaney, um, was very connected to Ellen Key, mm. the feminist intellectual and thinker. And um, she spent time in Stockholm with her at Strand. And she, uh, Wright actually sent her, um, not one of his own designs, but a Japanese print by Hiroshige mm. um, as a gift. And so that speaks still to that idea of go globalism yeah, yeah. that you brought up Absolutely. a bit earlier. Yeah. 
I think that's, I think all of the designers that I've mentioned today and who have sort of made an imprint in the design world have never worked in isolation. I think they've always been inspired and, and had an outlook beyond their own um, borders, so to speak. And, and that's a great example. And I think one of the, going along with that, one of the interesting things you brought up at the beginning was this notion that um, perhaps Swedish and Danish design evolved quite differently after mm. World War II and mid-century. And I didn't know if you had any ideas accounting for why that may have been or what specific factors would have shaped that. I, I really don't know. I think there, there are... Um, uh, I don't even think you can pin it down to a certain sense of nationalism that sort of differs from the two countries. Um, but I, I would say that if you look back now, and my examples are from my perspective, I'm sure a, a different person would have brought other uh, examples forward, but I think there is still a different sense of the, the coherent design sort of thread that you see um, from the two countries. Yeah, yeah, mm. it's so closely linked and yet so mm. very different, for sure. Definitely, and I think that's also what's so interesting with these talks is that each country um, will have approached that very differently, mm -hmm. um, all based on also their own historical context yeah. and all the things that are happening outside of design, of course. Outside of design, and that, well, that's one of the things I found so fascinating about your talk is how design can be used to build community and how it can be used to bring together somewhat disparate communities and working together. And I really love the project that you initiated working with sort of one of the most Swedish materials of the land, bringing mm. the wooden chairs, um, and not just reflecting on that historical perspective, but bringing groups of people from various backgrounds together, people mm. who don't know each other and who are being forced to work together and build something that's functional is really terrific. How did you come up with that idea? Um, well, it, it was very much Fredrik Paulsen's idea mm -hmm. to, to do that. And um, I think it was more our fear of having a workshop in the museum with a saw and a hammer and a drill and mm -hmm. what's gonna happen. But of course, nothing happened. People behave themselves. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, so no, it was fantastic. But I think it was more a, a testing ground for how these types of collaborations also can be applied in other projects, of course, yeah. in the museum for the future. But um, my experience coming to Sweden as well, having been in the UK for so long is, you know, you think you're all Europeans, you're all quite, the same but we're not we are very different and um, there is a formality in Sweden which it takes it, ta it takes time to break the ice in the social gatherings and settings so my I was very curious to see what happens when you put four strangers in a room to make a chair and and um, but it was fantastic you know that the small talk as soon as you have something practical to do and you're trying to produce a result then then you can sort of hide behind that and just get the stuff done. And, and uh, yeah, no, it was, it was really enriching for both parts, I would say. I was curious if you'd done any follow-up with that, have any of the if you know if any of the people have stayed in contact or if there's any sort of... Yes, we have a few who, who are emailing, asking when is the next session. <laughs> but uh, we try to kind of treat the whole point of the project was also to, to give value to the things that were being produced. Um, so we made sure that they all had labels like a, a museum object and so forth. And some people will still post it on their social media or we will have it up in, in the museum for the public to see. So it's still live and well, but not in the same scale perhaps as before. I love that because I think one of the challenge working with design um, is always how do you make it alive mm -hmm. and contemporary, especially with historic collections um, that aren't perhaps, um, and I don't want to use the word indigenous, but um, that aren't your own collections and how you can use those today to interpret the present and mm -hmm. the present mm -hmm. issues that we're facing and you um, talked about uh, the environment certainly as one of the most important and the mm, role of mm. materials in the environment. 
Um, but also, I know immigration and um, the current crises that are going on in the world today, um, from Europe, from the Middle East, from Africa, um, and all over, really, mm -hmm. um, and how that's changing what Swedish design is. How do you see that evolving or shifting? There is a real interest from the younger generation to be much more conscious about the materials that they use. Mm -hmm. um, and also different types of manufacturing processes are being explored. So you do order on demand instead of mass manufacturing. Uh, you do smaller batches of furniture. Mm -hmm. You um, think especially with, with uh, wooden furniture. Mm -hmm. It's of course been very common that you, you source the material uh, outside of Sweden and also the production is done outside of Sweden, more and more companies now promote themselves as this is Swedish wood made in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the only kind of um, challenge with that is that also the costs are what they are. So they are still very expensive pieces and only a certain market will afford to buy it. Um, but I think there, there is a shift in, in the way that things are produced and handled. And I think also your point about design, what I tried to also illustrate earlier was that design is not just the products perhaps that we associate with design. The, the handicrafts are also part of the design. You wouldn't have had design if it hadn't been for the handicrafts mm -hmm. and how that whole trajectory has, has developed and evolved over hundreds and thousands of years. And, and you see now also a resurgence of the interest in Schleid, in, in the, the craft scene, mm -hmm. and also even how designers who might have been more just sketching and drawing and uh, giving it to the manufacturer that there is an interest in uh, themselves also learning how these things are made and where the materials come from. So mm -hmm. there is a, a much greater consciousness around it. But I think there is still the market that will always challenge, um, especially those who are already well established. Mm -hmm. They often speak of it as something very, um, uh, as to prove that they're conscious about it. But when it comes to the actual manufacturing through the company that they, their designs are being manufactured by, you know that they are not necessarily up to the, to the task. <laughs> Right. So, so, you know, it's, it's greenwashing, of course, there is mm -hmm. in, in the, in the yeah. realm of, of design as well. Yeah. And, of course, also the issue of consumption and yeah. Yeah. personal consumption and mm -hmm. public consumption Absolutely. and all of that. Yeah. 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 Um, is there something that you did not have a chance to talk about that you really wanted to speak about? I know we're limited to these 40-minute... Um, panels, but was there something that really struck oh, you? Oh, I feel like I spoke t too long. <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably, probably bored already. No, I, I don't know. I mean, there is so much to be said. I think with, with the questions that um, the, the Nordic Museum came up with, they were brilliant. But once you start kind of putting those apart, you can, you can go on forever. Um, and, but they are very relevant. And I think it's, it's always interesting to both look at each nation and to mm -hmm. try and find their specificities. But I think also, as with, with uh, the global world as it is, it's harder and harder to pigeonhole uh, these nations. And I, I don't know if that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. I personally think we shouldn't be too concerned that that's, this is how the world is evolving. Uh, but uh, I'd be very interested to hear your views as well on that, because I think it's very easy maybe for someone who tries to compress everything in a museum to try and make it be all. But a different view, I'm sure, is held by, by, the, by the users of design in general. So. Well, thank you, Nina. That was really terrific. Um, I certainly learned a lot from your presentation, um, and I really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.